Legends of the South. Spoilers all books! Hello there, and welcome to Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere in Boston. And I'm Yug Boy in England. We're very glad you've tuned into our show today, which is all about the myths and legends of the South. Yeah, in part one, we covered the North and talked about the story within a story technique. This time, we'll consider those legends south of the neck. If you didn't yet hear the Northern episode, don't worry, this one will play fine as a standalone. And today's overarching theme will be of the locality of legends, their place in society and their effect on the populace. We believe George has put a good amount of thought into his universe mythos, and today we will have it under close examination. We will make an extra effort to explain where George might have drawn inspiration from and underline where there are clear cultural nods, and take the time to explain these parallels. So, locality and influences will feature large today, and we have a vast array of Legends of Ice and Fire to draw from. We'll begin in the Reach with all-father figure Garth Greenhand and his many children. We'll also consider Sermon of the Mirror Shield's exploits. Then over to the Westerlands, Kolos gets a ray of sunshine and trickster legend Lan the Clever works his ambiguous talents. How did he winkle the rock? We have a thing or two to say about that. And the Stormlands will be up next, where Duran becomes the god's grief, and a perfect knight rides into town. Not wanting to be outdone, the Vale will offer us a winged knight or two, and a woman who could cry a literal river. The Riverlands offer us a knight and a fool, with maidens and a pool, the legend of Florian and Jonquil. In the Crownlands, we meet once more with Radio Westeros' favourite, Nimble Dick Crab, as we wonder what lies beneath the fishy underbelly of the Squishers. And the Iron Isles is a cold, hard place. Will the legends of the Grey King, Torgon, and Hrothgar of Pike reflect this? And Dorne will be our final region, where we'll see Nymeria and a theme of asylum amidst a hellish journey. And we will also comment on any lesser legends we find in the world book, regardless of obscurity. Fans of the Knight Without Armour, Green King of the God's Eye, and the countless others less celebrated, expect micro-size analysis for micro stories. Overall, this should be an intriguing look at a host of legends, where we'll be weaving in recurring themes and influences. And speaking of the influential, we want to give a shout out to all of you who have joined our Patreon campaign, including our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patrons, John Wargarian and Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Rory, Ashley, Laura, Sister Winter, Kelly, Lord Commander Daenerys Flint, and Harry Krishna. And if you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, find our campaign at Patreon, where you can donate any amount on a per-episode basis and get access to a host of rewards such as early access, shout-outs, and our Patreon episode on Varamir. And now, let's get going with Myths and Legends of the South. According to the most well-regarded accounts from the Citadel, anywhere from 8,000 to 12,000 years ago, in the southernmost reaches of Westeros, a new people crossed the strip of land that bridged the narrow sea and connected the eastern lands with the land in which the children and giants lived. It was here that the first men came into Dorne via the broken arm, which was not yet broken. Why these people left their homelands is lost to all knowing, but when they came, they came in force. Thousands entered and began to settle the lands, and as the decades passed, they pushed farther and farther north. Such tales as we have of those migratory days are not to be trusted, for they suggest that, within a few short years, the first men had moved beyond the neck and into the north. Yet in truth, it would have taken decades even centuries, for this to occur. In part one, we saw how legends related to ages of man, culture, institution, 
and region in the north. Today we'll be looking at regions somewhat removed from the north and we have a mixed bag as we traverse from the Westerlands to Dawn, from the Stormlands to the Vale, from the Reach to the Iron Islands and more. And such diversity in geography and culture gives us the chance to evaluate further the relation between myth, legend and locality, with every part of the Seven Kingdoms being discussed. With such an emphasis on region, it might be worth contemplating the place of local legends in our own world, something which George, who says verisimilitude is one of his chief world-building goals, surely considers. In August of 2016, Lady Gwynne found herself in England. Knowing that she had studied the legend of King Arthur, I took her to his alleged birthplace, Tintagel in Cornwall. We spent the day as tourists exploring the myth and the town and saw for ourselves the power of an old legend. Yeah, it was very apparent from our trip that King Arthur had brought a lot of pride to the area where they were keen to have any association with the legend. Despite some of that perhaps being inspired by the pursuit of tourist coin, there was still an underlying sense of self-definition for the area, coming from a legend that's endured for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we can see that in the real world, legends can become part of a region's identity and self-concept, tied to tales of yore. And so our own taste of immersion in local legend taught us of the pride, the glory, the entertainment, the education, and the explaining of the unexplainable that a story can bear. We were merely tourists, but the benefit of the legend to the area was beyond the financial. It has taught its people who they are across the ages. So when George, who we know has researched heavily and travelled far and wide, writes his legends, he is certainly attempting to imbue his localities with myths and stories that help to define its inhabitants. With Westeros being so large, and with the kingdoms all having their own characteristics, we wonder if George set out to use legends to aid the defining of distinct cultural identities. With this in mind, let's begin today with a region that has an extensive and pervasive mythos. So let's head to the Reach. Once and always a great realm, the Reach is many things to its inhabitants. The most populous, fertile and powerful domain in the Seven Kingdoms. The Reach is the largest and most populous of the Southern Kingdoms, and so it's no surprise when we see a large number of troops under the Tyrells in the main books. The Reach was once a smaller kingdom, standing alongside the lands of Old Town, the Arbor, and the Western Marches, but these four are now consolidated under the Reach banner. It was the Reach of Old that was ruled by the Gardeners, from whom the Tyrells claimed descent. The gardeners presided over a vast expanse of fields and farms, lakes and rivers, hills and woods, and fragrant meadows. Marketplaces thrived, and with such agricultural resources, so did the people. And so it's the farms and the bounty that feed the people who have kept the reach strong through the ages, once and always a great realm, the most populous, fertile, powerful domain, its wealth only second to the gold of the West. Altogether, the reach of old and new has good reason to value its farmers and green fields, and to understand the relationship between abundance and population as causal and cyclical. And so, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised what themes arise within the central legend of the reach. The Tyrells can trace their descent back to Garth Greenhand. So can the Florence, the Rowans, the Oakarts, and half the noble houses of the South. Garth liked to plant his seed in fertile ground, they say. I shouldn't wonder that more than his hands were green. In the first episode, we mentioned that in the North, they credit their first king, with leading man over the land bridge into Westeros for settlement. 
However, another school of thought is that Garth Greenhands was responsible for this deed, and a whole lot more. The story of the Reach begins with Garth, who is presented as not just a legendary progenitor, but as an all-father to other legendary forebears. Some allege he's the ancestor of Bran the Builder, Lan the Clever, and Dur on God's Grief, among others from the Age of Heroes. With our use of the term all-father, some of your minds might be arriving at Odin of Norse mythology, but in truth, Garth Greenhand seems to take more inspiration from Celtic and British mythology. According to Irish myth, the Dagda is a father figure associated with fertility and agriculture, and so could have been a model for Garth. Like the Dagda, Garth is thought by some to be a god, although there is said to be a thousand tales which are predictably contradictory. Not content with having him lead the first men to their new home, some folk believe he preceded the arrival by thousands of years, wandering the land alone and treating with giants and the children of the forest. Even his name is contested. Green Hand, Green Hair, or simply Garth the Green. At least all seem to agree that the man was green somehow. Although this figure was associated with the greenness of growth, the green title also has an association with nature's magic in-universe, such as green seers with their wisdoms and longevity. This thought is more interesting in light of the rumors that he had stag antlers. Old Nan says the same thing of the mysterious green men who reside on the Isle of Faces. But the more common image is a man dressed all in green, or whose greenery came from his gift for gardening. I think we've all heard the term green fingers, meaning an aptitude in horticulture. And like the Dagda, Garth Greenhands is seen as a leader, magician, or god with regards to both farming and fertility. In agriculture, Garth is said to have taught men how to farm, advancing them from hunter-gatherers. He gave them the gift of seed, taught them the necessary techniques which advanced man beyond other races. He carried with him an inexhaustible supply of seeds that he continually scattered, no doubt bringing green health to the reach. And with the repeated mention of seed, Garth's gift for agriculture overlapped with his gift for fertility. In ancient cultures, farming and fertility would go hand in hand, given the symbolic similarities and the causal relationship between the two. With better crops came better health and abundance, more celebration of life, and a need and opportunity for the population to grow. In short, if planting seeds in the fields and growing crops brought yields, there would be more reason to plant seed of a different sort. And so these things would become inextricably linked in agricultural mindsets. The double meaning of fertility is toyed with in the tales of Garth Greenhands and the Dagda. Yeah, with Garth, it says he brought the gift of fertility with him. Nor was it only the earth that he made fecund, for the legends tell us that he could make barren women fruitful with a touch, even crones whose moon blood no longer flowed. Maidens ripened in his presence, mothers brought forth twins or even triplets when he blessed them, young girls flowered at his smile. Lords and common men alike offered up their virgin daughters to him wherever he went, that their crops might ripen and their trees grow heavy with fruit. There was never a maid that he deflowered who did not deliver a strong son or fair daughter nine moons later, or so the stories say. Or, as the witty Lady Elena Tyrell says, Garth liked to plant his seed in fertile ground, they say. I shouldn't wonder that more than his hands were green. So we can see that, according to legend, Garth had some kind of mysterious power over nature, and he used it to excel mankind. However, an interesting sidebar in the world book suggests that it came at a cost. Yeah, it suggested that very old tales of Garth are darker and proposes two things. First, that in order to receive a bountiful harvest, blood sacrifice had to be made from his worshippers. Second, in variations, 
that Garth himself was sacrificed every autumn only to be reborn in spring. And with this sidebar, we have another allusion to real-world folklore. James Fraser, in his 1890 book, The Golden Bough, exposed a widespread pattern he'd discovered in ancient societies, human sacrifice. Fraser collected repeated mentions in mythologies of a sacred king figure. Remembering primitive agricultural societies, lived and died by what grew and what didn't, it's understandable that the issue caused some deep-rooted superstition based around hopes and fears. This sacred king theory, called the Corn King by some, outlined the primitive belief that a human sacrifice would enable a successful harvest. There is evidence of similar phenomena from the Celts to the Aztecs. The sacred king, more specifically, was the sacrifice of the leader, as they were thought to be the ultimate gift to offer. The idea that the king is killed and reborn in the spring, just like the crops, was seemingly very important. In lieu of resurrection magic, the societies could simply pick a new king, and would have him wear the same crown, so it was a rebirth of sorts. And if kings were hard to replace, a symbolic king could be used, made of wicker into the shape of a man. The large wicker man would be set alight in the autumn quarter, but sometimes the wicker man wasn't enough of a sacrifice, and so a hole would be made inside, just big enough for an unlucky person. Ooh, so there's some of the human sacrifice stroke sacred king variations in the mythos. There's an old folk song called Tom Barleycorn in Britain. It was first printed in the 1500s, yet who knows how far back it originated in the oral tradition. It had no doubt survived hundreds of years of telling before it met ink just as first men tales survived until they were written properly by the Andals. In the song, Tom Barleycorn is a man being slowly tortured, murdered and consumed with methods that follow and allude to the harvesting of barley. Here's an excerpt from the Robert Burns version. They've ta'en a weapon long and sharp and cut him by the knee. They tied him fast upon a cart like a rogue for forgery. They filled up a darksome pit with water to the brim. They heaved in John Barleycorn. They let him sink or swim. They wasted o'er a scorching flame the marrow o' his bones. But a miller used him worst of all, for he crushed him tween two stones. And they had ta'en his very heart's blood and drank it round and round. And still the more and more they drank, their joy did more abound. So the murder of John Barleycorn there, an allegory of making beer with barley. One has to wonder why this process was personified so unsubtly, why it's so brutal, and why this tale has endured hundreds and hundreds of years of telling. James Frazier thought he found the answer with his comparative studies across cultures in his conclusions about ritual human sacrifice. If you enjoy this mythos, we can recommend the Wicker Man original movie, and that's the 1973 version with Christopher Lee. Closer to home, look out for Barleycorns appearing in A Song of Ice and Fire, including Watt Barleycorn, a farmer from the Reach. And altogether, this sidebar seems to be a definite nod by George about such myths and phenomenon as the Corn King. Remembering that resurrection is a central part of the process, we can't help but think of Jon Snow, who was stabbed at the end of A Dance with Dragons. And earlier in that same novel, we get this from Mormont's Raven. Corn, the bird said, and King, and Snow, Jon Snow, Jon Snow. So... You can see how the bird is throwing these words at John. Without the narration, the sentence reads like this. Corn King, Snow, John Snow. Could this be an intertextual hint to John's resurrection? Yeah, a lot of fans do seem to think so. 
And anyway, back to Garth, we can see George is taking some delight with his references, a staple of the world book. With such links to harvesting and fertility in the vein of the Dagda, a high king who could control crops and share his land between his array of children, it's no surprise that Garth, too, fathered many children, lots of whom became great in their own right, spawning numerous enduring houses. And the counter-argument is that the Reach might be overly proud and wanting to link all houses to their own overarching King and legend. We'll see today that with characters like Nimble Dick, how pride in their local legends can blind them to the unlikeliness of the myth. It's not hard to imagine, as Yandel contemplates, Garth as a petty king, somehow made into a god. We think the notion that he's simply the first king, the same one that the northerners believe in, who came across the arm of dawn, is also a possibility. But with a legend like this, whose stories number the thousands, like his alleged children, we just don't know what's behind the myth. Could there have been a man who mastered the lands? Is there some magical insinuation with his greenness? Or was he just a great leader whose legend came from the strength he gave to his people? Perhaps like King Arthur? For now, Garth Greenhand is right where he should be, at the center of an unknowable mystery. And next, we're going to investigate Garth's progeny. The list is long, and many are the legends, for there is scarce a noble house in all the reach that does not boast of descent from one of Garth Greenhand's countless children. Even the heroes of other lands and kingdoms are sometimes numbered amongst the offspring of the Green Hand. Garth Greenhands had countless children according to legend, and some of them grew famous in their own right. We know of 14 such celebrated children, many of whom spawned famous houses, so let's begin with Garth the Gardener. Named as the greatest of Garth's children, Garth the gardener made his home atop a hill near the Mander, which became one of the most beautiful estates in the world, High Garden. He formed House Gardener, who were a mighty house for thousands of years. Garth the gardener was powerful in his lifetime, rightful king of all men, and he wore a crown of vines and flowers. Garth Greenhands' other children apparently all swore him fealty. We've wondered if the two Gars, depicted as father and son, could in fact be the same person, a king who led his people across the arm and settled on the great river Manda, where food was plentiful. However, that is little more than speculation, and the mists of time are especially dense around these Gars. And next is Brandon of the Bloody Blade, who's said to be a forebear of Bran the Builder. Could this be the Reachmen trying to steal thunder and associate themselves with every great deed in the land? Whereas Bran the Builder used giants and children of the forest to build his monuments, his alleged forefather was intent on destroying them. His bloodthirstiness was legendary, with a blue lake being renamed Red Lake due to his mass slaughter of the children. And Floris Fox is next, said to be the cleverest of Garth's progeny. She is said to have birthed Lan the Clever. Again, we wonder if those Reachmen aren't trying to exert cultural dominance once more. Flora seems like a cunning fox maintaining three marriages with the husbands blissfully unaware of her polygamy. The result was the founding of the three houses, Florent, Ball and Peak. And Gilbert of the Vines, who could have been named White and Red Hand, given he's credited for bringing winemaking to the arbor. He founded House Redwine, who, we're sure, raised their glass to Gilbert. And his half-sister, Ellen Eversweet, was just as busy, but this time with bees. She sought out the King of Bees in his mountain hideaway hive, and promised to care for all the King Bee's ancestors in return for their sweet honey. She was the first beekeeper who founded House Beesbury. 
Rose of Red Lake was said to be a skin changer with the ability to change into a crane. Notice her name boasts of Red Lake, which is where we said there were children of the forest fighting with Brandon of the Bloody Blade. So it's interesting that we have a skin changer in an area where there were children of the forest. And Rose is also reputed to be the founder of House Crane. And Boars the Breaker founded House Bulwer after the man drank bull's blood and gained incredible strength. Thousands of years later, and Reachman Randall Tarley hires warlocks to bathe his son Samuel in bull's blood to make him stronger, which only made him wretch. We wonder if Randall got the idea from a certain Reach legend. And Rowan Goldtree is the mother of House Rowan. She saw her lover leave her for a richer rival, and so she wrapped an apple in her hair, planted it, and a rich golden tree grew. Golden apples grew, which are a staple in real-world folk tales and mythology, featuring in Irish, Greek, and Norse stories with various meanings. Here, Rowan seems to simply want her greedy lover back. Perhaps it worked, as there are alternate rumors that Lan the Clever is her son. And speaking of apples... Foss the archer could shoot the apple off the head of any maid that he liked, which sounds like a perfectly reasonable flirtation strategy. Both apples of the Fossaway tree fell under him. And Owen Oakenshield supposedly conquered the shield isles to the west of the mainland, driving the Merlings and Selkies, who are seals in water and humans on land, away. The name Oakenshield is an obvious nod to Tolkien's Thorin Oakenshield, and one of the shield isles still bears that title. And Harlon the Hunter and Herndon of the Horn built Horn Hill that the Tallies now reside in taking a beautiful woods witch as their joint wife. The brothers didn't age because of her magic, and let's hope she wasn't wearing a glamour. And Maris the Maid was Garth's fairest daughter. Fifty lords tried to win her hand at the very first tourney in Westeros. Argoth Stoneskin won, yet King Uthor of Hightower wed her quickly to Argoth's wrath. Finally, John the Oak, who the Oak Hearts relate to, was called the First Knight. His mother was apparently a giantess, and he grew up to 12 feet tall. He's said to have brought chivalry to Westeros, despite the logical and oft-repeated claim that knighthood came over with the Andals thousands of years later. Such anomalies exist in real-world mythology too, and George seems to be fermenting contradiction in his own lore to mirror this. That said, with his height and his manners, John the Oak might have been the definition of a gentle giant. So, overall, Garth Greenhands is a hugely pervasive legend, understandably thought of as a god by some, given some of his supposed deeds. The Reach are no doubt proud of his lineage, touched by a god who left so much greatness on the world. His children continue his legend, with many of the boons and skills found in their society being explained by the early line of Garth Greenhand. And this array of children invites all parts of the Reach and other places as well to bask in Garth's legend. They can take a branch of their own and gain pride in whichever of Garth's children affected their lives, whilst figuratively bowing down to the greater legend. This makes for local pride and individualism whilst consolidating the region as a whole under the misty memory of their godlike forebear. Garth Greenhand and his children is a mythos suitable for a land of natural bounty, fertility and abundance. The Reach and Garth really go hand in green hand. Up next, we analyze another Reach legend that's less green and more Greek. Every dwarf is a bastard in his father's eyes. No doubt. Well, Hugo Hill, answer me this. How did Serwin of the Mirror Shield slay the dragon Eurax? 
Serwyn of the Mirror Shield was a famed warrior of old, first mentioned to us by Bran when he excitedly pondered the arrival of Kingsguard in Winterfell. It says, Their names were like music to him, Serwyn of the Mirror Shield, Sir Ryan Redwine, Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight. However, elsewhere we learn that Serwyn was from the Age of Heroes and was a first man, living long before the Kingsguard institution ever arose. We see such anachronisms time and time again, making the Citadel suspicious enough to discard some tales entirely. We think there's usually a truth in the stories, and World Book co-author Elio Garcia described Sowin's contradiction like this. Sowin of the Mirror Shield is a figure of the Age of Heroes, according to George. His inclusion in the Kingsguard is typical bardic confusion of time periods for the sake of stories. So, it's wise not to get too bogged down in the anachronistic nature of titles when there are singers who would transform a plain warrior into a sir, as Maester Yandel describes. For the sake of a warm place in some lord's hall, in such a way does some long-dead first man become a knight who follows the seven and guards the Targaryen kings thousands of years after he lived, if he ever did. And the legions of boys and youths made ignorant of the past history of Westeros by these foolish tales cannot be numbered. So Sirwin's time would be many thousands, not hundreds, of years ago. One song Sansa thinks of seems to betray Sirwin as a brave rescuer. He saved Princess Darissa from giants. This gives Sirwin appeal to both Bran and Sansa, who have a commonality in their love of old tales, although the sister especially likes those with romantic overtones. Through her arc, Sansa often resembles the damsel in distress, and so this manner of story is very pertinent to her, and in this case it's her darling Joffrey rescuing her. Let's hope Sansa Stark ultimately elevates from such a helpless role and becomes proactive in her escape from dastardly subordination, leaving such fairy tales as this firmly behind her. And as Maester Lewin told Bran, You must put these dreams aside. They will only break your heart. So, Sirwin is an extremely popular legend, and this popularity is seized upon by Littlefinger, who turns the head of another chivalric dreamer, Loras Tyrell, and subconsciously convinces him to join the Kingsguard. It says, Men in my party supplied grisly tales about how the mob had killed Sir Preston Greenfield and raped the Lady Lawless, and slipped a few silvers to Lord Tyrell's army of singers to sing of Ryan Redwine, Sirwin of the Mirror Shield, and Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight. A harp can be as dangerous as a sword in the right hands. But even this far in, in Storm, and we don't know exactly how Sirwin won acclaim in regards to his Mirror Shield. It's not until A Dance with Dragons that we learn he was a dragon slayer. Halden Halfmaester quizzes Tyrion on dragon lore and asks him how Serwyn killed Eurax. Tyrion replies that he approached behind his shield. Eurax saw only his own reflection until Serwyn had plunged his spear through his eye. So, this seems to be Serwyn's defining moment, and it's one straight out of Greek mythology. Medusa was a gorgon, generally described as a woman with wings and venomous snakes for hair that was so hideous to look upon, her gaze could turn one to stone. The hero of the story, Perseus, was given a mirror shield by Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Perseus was able to see Medusa via the mirror shield and behead her. And here George takes the mirror shield concept and has a dragon see themselves until close enough that Serwin could launch a surprise attack and put his spear through Eurax's eye. This shows Serwin's extreme bravery and it should be noted that during the Dance of the Dragons another would-be hero tried the same trick again. Byron Swan of the Greens crept up behind his shield, as Serwin had done, and tried to kill Syrax. As Tyrion recounts, 
He was roasted for his trouble. Okay, so life was not a song for Byron Swan. And our final observation about Serwin comes from Danny, who tells Dario that the hero was, quote, haunted by the ghosts of all the knights he'd killed, which at once sounds Shakespearean and also relates to the broken men of the story who are psychologically scarred by war. In the immediate scene, however, Dario replies that he would kill any man who came to haunt him all over again, highlighting his lack of conscience. So overall, Serwin is a truly heroic figure that appeals to the imaginations of several characters. With the inclusion of dragons and giants, his tales have a fairy tale quality, and so it's difficult to gauge a provenance. Knowing of his battle guilt and hauntings was an unexpected touch, which at once grounded the legend in a degree of realism. It's not difficult to see why the Reach would be very proud of this legend who is known in all corners of Westeros. In those centuries of trial and tumult, the Reach produced many a fearless warrior. From that day to this, the singers have celebrated the deeds of knights like Serwin of the Mirror Shield, Davos the Dragon Slayer, Roland of the Horn, and the Knight Without Armor. In the World Book, three more heroes from the Reach are mentioned. Davos the Dragon Slayer, Roland of the Horn, and the Knight Without Armor. Other than the fact these men are still celebrated, little information is given other than their names. All three are named knights, despite living in the Age of Heroes, which by now doesn't come as a surprise. And like Serwin, Davos the Dragon Slayer indicates that there were dragons in Westeros back in the Age of Heroes. We gather from George that there were once dragons everywhere, yet we also know that the Targaryens brought them from Valyria not so long ago. So what happened with dragons between these two points remains shrouded in the mists of time. And Roland of the Horn is even less understood. His name suggests only that he might have resided at Horn Hill, the current Tarly seat. And finally, we have the Knight Without Armor. You can be forgiven for imagining a naked knight on the battlefield, but perhaps this was merely a nod to the 1930s James Hilton novel of the same name, or its movie adaptation starring Marlene Dietrich. In that story, the knight without armor is a metaphor for a spy being someone who places themselves amidst extreme danger without any protective defenses. Perhaps George had a similar metaphor in mind for his knight without armor. And from divine gardeners to dragon slayers, we hope you've enjoyed our look at the legends of the Reach, where we found mythos mirroring the natural environment and people in suitable abundance. Next, we head to the only place richer than the Reach as we check out the Westerlands. The Westerlands are a place of rugged hills and rolling plains, of misty dales and craggy shorelines, a place of blue lakes and sparkling rivers and fertile fields of broadleaf forests that teem with game of every sort, where half-hidden doors in the sides of wooded hills open onto labyrinthine caves that wend their way through darkness to reveal unimaginable wonders and vast treasures deep beneath the earth. As we heard in the quote, the Westerlands has unimaginable treasures beneath its surface, namely gold. Hence, mining is to the West what agriculture is to the Reach, but such is the value of gold that the West is the richest of the regions. Whereas farms are widespread in the Reach, gold can only come from concentrated areas of potential. Whoever controls these areas will be empowered as the economy and prosperity of the entire region revolves around this culture of gold mining. And the central focus of this operation has always been Casterly Rock, the region's mighty seat that George has said was modelled on the Rock of Gibraltar. 
Such is the influence of this castle, in accordance with its gold, that the city of Lannisport functions around the created industry. It's no surprise, then, that the major legends of the Westerlands concern the rock and its gold, in the same way the Reach bows to Garth Greenhand's cultivation. And golden they may be, but Casterly Rock didn't begin with the Lannisters. By far the greatest lords in the Westerlands were the Casterlies of the Rock, who had their seat in the colossal stone that rose beside the Sunset Sea. Legend tells us the first Casterly Lord was a huntsman, Corlos, son of Castor, who lived in a village near to where Lannisport stands today. Long before the Lannisters ever sunk their paws into the Westerlands, the most famed family in the region were the Castellies. The World Book insinuates the mighty Castellie Rock is ancient. The story goes that a huntsman named Corlos came upon a lion preying on the local sheep. And lions and lambs bring to mind a biblical passage outlining the inherent incompatibility of certain creatures until peace returns to the land. Here in Westeros, however, the village lambs were being mercilessly slaughtered, and so Corlos bravely followed the lion into its habitat, a cave den. Armed with only a spear, he killed the lion and its mate. However, Corlos wasn't so bloodthirsty when it came to the newborn cubs and allowed them to live in an act of mercy. The old gods were suitably impressed by the act and so sent forth a ray of light to illuminate the cave, shining a light on the ample supply of gold embedded into the stone. Maester Yandel says... Corlos beheld the gleam of yellow gold, a vein as thick as a man's waist. And so, Corlos began to mine the cave for its gold, fortifying the entrance to protect his prize. He also played the role of progenitor, and soon his cave within a rock became a habitat for the family, and his descendants delved deeper and deeper into the earth, carving all manner of rooms within the gigantic stone, which became a mighty fastness that dwarfed every castle in Westeros. Corlos's father had been named Castor, and so they were the Castellies of the Rock. The fact that Corlos's family replaced the lions by living in their den is interesting, given the pride of Lannisters in the current story. And their gold made them the richest lords in all of Westeros, though they were never kings. This laid the foundation for the wealthy modern Lannisters. Overall, an intriguing story based around finding an abundance of riches in an unlikely place, and in this sense borrows from the Lost World genre initiated by H. Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines. The parts about a family mining gold in the cave, turning it into a fort, and then a home over time, seems like a plausible explanation for how the rock came about. We also know that lions have wandered the Westerlands even recently due to the Clegane tale of Sander's grandfather saving Tytos Lannister from a lioness, and so the story of a man hunting and killing troublesome lions seems perfectly plausible. The old god's controlling of the light, however, is perhaps the mythologized aspect in the story, but adds a moral and reward to the tale that elevates it into a parable. And, as we said, it has a somewhat biblical feel. But for all his gold mining, designing and siring, Corlos is still not the historical figure most famous in the Westerlands, with zero mentions in the five books. That prize was winkled by another, more inclined to use his wits than his spear. By then the Dawn Age had given way to the Age of Heroes. That was when the golden-haired rogue called Lan the Clever appeared from out of the East. Some say he was an Andal adventurer from across the narrow sea, 
though this was millennia before the coming of the Andals to Westeros. Regardless of its origins, the tales agree that somehow Lan the Clever winkled the Castellis out of their rock and took it for his own. Our introduction to the legend of Lan the Clever comes from Ned. In trying to unravel the death of John Arryn, he studies a great and ponderous tome, the lineages and histories of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms with descriptions of many high lords and noble ladies and their children. He opened to the section on House Lannister once more and turned the pages slowly, hoping against hope that something would leap out at him. The Lannisters were an old family tracing their descent back to Lan the Clever, a trickster from the Age of Heroes, who was no doubt as legendary as Bran the Builder, though far more beloved of singers and tale-tellers. In the songs, Lan was the fellow who winkled the Castellis out of Castellis Rock, with no weapon but his wits, and stole gold from the sun to brighten his curly hair. Ned wished he were here now to winkle the truth out of this damnable book. So we learn three things about Land: His legendary status, that he winkled Casterly Rock somehow, and that he stole gold from the sun to color his hair. The latter claim is the most dubious and is included as more of a clue to Ned about Joffrey's own lineage than an assertion to take literally, of course. However, the second claim about Casterly Rock seems like the key to this legend. Before we examine the possibilities, it might be wise to gather the supplementary information about Lan. In the five books, we only learn that his ghost is said to haunt the rock by some. Fortunately, the world book offers more on Lan. As we mentioned earlier, some claim he was descended from Garth Greenhand via either Floris the Fox or Rowan Goldtree, which you can take well salted. Yet of interest might be the claim from both tales that Lan was born a bastard, which might be pertinent to his winkling of the rock. And such is the mystery around Lan that some believe him to be a first man amidst the Lannister line of many Andals, whereas others claim Lan was an adventuring Andal, come from Essos long before the Andal landing. And where all tales converge is that somehow Lan the Clever winkled the rock away from the Casterlies and took it for his own. Maester Yandel recounts numerous explanations by way of tales and legends, and we'll be adding our own ideas too. Okay, so first of all is the most common story. Lan the Clever crept through a secret tunnel, coating himself in butter to fit. And once inside the rock, he fermented paranoia and discord among the Castellis. The insinuation that some kind of haunting would drive a very powerful family from their own seat and to seemingly fall off the end of the earth seems highly improbable to us. More likely that George is creating some fun with tales of buttering up and whispering fallacies into sleeping men's ears. Our minds are never far from Tyrion with this one, given Cersei's insistence that the imp is hidden behind the walls of the Red Keep with malicious intent. Surely she'd heard this tale as a child. And next, Lan doesn't squeeze through the secret cleft himself. Rather, he directs rats and vermin into Casterly Rock, which again seems amusing but troublesome, and relates to a taller tale still which replaces rats with lions, given the tale claims to purport the using of wits only, having a devoured Casterly reader seems to miss the point, but perhaps a good story around a campfire. Yeah, quite like that one. I'm not sure it's the real answer, though. And in the, quote, bawdiest of stories, Lan has sex with the daughters of the rock while they sleep, and in nine months' time they give birth in their chaste confusion. This is quite a despicable tale, 
and has clearly suffered some hyperbole, but does introduce the notion of Lan entering his own heir into the line, something we'll see Archmaester Peristan take influence from later. And there are two further possibilities that seem interesting and curious to us. In the Reach section of the World Book, set aside, is an account claiming Lan lied and wrongfully convinced Garth Greenhand he was his son, eventually to take off with Garth's real children's inheritance. Now the Garth Greenhand part is surely myth, but perhaps swapped with Lord Casterly, could the rest of the tale hold true? Hmm. And finally... Archmaester Paristan says that Lan was a retainer of some sort in service to Lord Casterly, perhaps a household guard, who impregnated his lordship's daughter, or daughters, though that seems less likely, and persuaded her father to give him the girl's hand in marriage. If indeed this was what occurred, assuming as we must, that Lord Casterly had no true-born sons, then in the natural course of events, the rock would have passed to the daughter, and hence to Lan, upon the father's death. Okay, and so Archmaester Paristan posits a plausible theory for Lan the Clever. It's a perfectly logical take, and we can find no inherent fatal flaw, given the restrictions involved in decrypting the Age of Heroes. It's an idea as good as any, but we wonder if George would really lay out the true answer to the mystery via a maester like this. So alternately, readers should perhaps consider what parts of the world book's theories are the most plausible and, you know, come up with your own ideas for Land the Clever. As for our own theorising, we like the notion that Lan was a bastard meaning he came from humble origins, and then convinced Lord Casterly that he was his son. If Lord Casterly had only daughters, perhaps Land convinced him to legitimise his bastard son, or lose Casterly to his daughter's suitor. Hence, Land could have taken the rock as an imposter. Yeah, history is full of royal imposter stories, something we're sure is not lost on George, who has surely heard similar insinuations in tales such as that of Helga de la Brache, a Swedish lady who convinced the authorities that she was the secret daughter of King Gustav IV of Sweden and Queen Federica of Baden. Helga claimed the pair had secretly remarried, resulting in her birth and entitling her to a generous royal income. The ruse was successful for many years until a newspaper investigation outed her as a maid from Stockholm who had made the whole thing up. Yes, Helga the Clever there. And our other idea is that Lan pretended to be above his station, perhaps claiming he was an important lord from across the narrow sea, remembering those tales about him being an adventurer from that way. In this theory, Lan upjumps himself by way of playing a role, once again the imposter. Perhaps he initially seduces the castly daughter after he secretly infiltrates the rock like in the tales. After convincing Lord Casterly and his now persuasive only daughter of his foreign importance, Lan would be free to take a hand and one day Castly Rock itself. So there's a couple of Land the Clever ideas, and notice that we were often refining some of what's been said in the world book with the belief that it's told to us for a reason. And regardless of how clever Land the Trickster winkled the rock, the legend goes on that the line of the Casterlies disappeared and the Lannisters began their rule, claiming land as their forebear. According to tales, the family was blessed with both golden hair and fertility, and soon enough, Lan's descendants created Lannisport after Casterly Rock became overrun with Lannisters. And Lan himself is said to have lived to the ripe old age of 312, after siring 200 children. Overall, Lan the Clever is an intriguing origin story where his cunningness 
his look and his virility are all celebrated in the Westerlands. While the colour of his hair served Ned a direct clue about the royal illegitimacy, we wonder if the tale could relate to Tyrion's future. With Jaime wedded to the Kingsguard and Cersei female, Tyrion should be heir to Casterly Rock, yet wasn't considered such by Tywin. Perhaps Tyrion will have to take a leaf out of Lan's book and use his renowned wits if he is ever to winkle Casterly Rock. Other houses sprang from the loins of legendary heroes of whom tales are told to this very day. The Crake Halls from Crake the Boar Killer, the Baneforts from the Hooded Men, the Yews from the Blind Bowman Alan of the Oak, the Moorlands from Pate the Plowman. Okay, and now for a quick roundup of the lesser mentioned legends from the Westerlands. We have three who are all from the Age of Heroes and are purported to be originators of Westerlands houses. First, we have Craig the Boar Killer, alleged founder of, you've guessed it, House Craig Hall. Now we understand the Craig Hall sigil of a black and white boar. Who knows how many boars Craig killed to gain such renown, but let's hope he didn't meet the same fate as Robert Baratheon. The Craig Hall words, non Sophius, could denote the hero being particularly aggressive. And next, there's the founder of Noble House Banefort, the Hooded Man. This mysterious character is distinct from the Hooded King, who was embroiled in a 20-year-long war with King Lorien I Lannister. Hoods are frequently worn when characters want to conceal their identity, and with such little to go on, we can only wonder what it was this Hooded Man had to hide. Fans speculate the Banefort sigil of their founder wearing a black hood could be inspired by Archie comic superhero, the Black Hood. Then there's House Yu, founded by Alan of the Oak, otherwise known as the Blind Bowman. There's an old DC comic featuring Robin Hood on the front cover, blindfolded in an archery tourney. Perhaps George, a confessed comic fanatic, was influenced by this image in his naming of the Blind Bowman. And finally we have Pate the Plowman, founder of House Moorland. Often legendary heroes are warriors, builders, and so on, but here Pate is known for his plowing. Perhaps he was a farmer able to produce consistently high yields, an everyman's version of Garth Greenhand. Okay, so overall, the main legends of the West revolve around the golden boon provided by nature and exploited by man that's left its imprint upon all aspects of Westerland's culture. But it's good to know of these smaller, more localised legends, indicating provincial identity aside from the empowered gold rushes. So in the Westerlands, the gods shone their luck upon the inhabitants, but in the next section, we'll taste their wrath in the Stormlands. The storms that blow up the narrow sea are infamous throughout the Seven Kingdoms and in the nine free cities as well. Though they may arise in any season, seafarers say that the worst of them come each autumn as they cross the waters of Shipbreaker Bay before slamming into Storm's End on Durans Point. It is from these great gales that the Stormlands take their name. To be the focus of the nomenclature of an entire region, the storms in these lands must be formidable. The people of the Stormlands, especially in the heavily affected coastal areas, must have lived in both awe and fear of nature's wrath. Seafaring in these conditions is treacherous and farming difficult. As the Westerlands is built around Casterly Rock, the heart of the Stormlands is Storm's End, a castle that defied nature in its positioning. 
House Girandan made their name and consolidated the region as a mighty one to be feared along its marches. Hard places breed hard people, that much is certain, and with the howling gales and the roaring seas, it's no wonder this culture believed in sea gods and wind goddesses. And so we should expect Stormlander legends to be as tumultuous as their natural environment, just like the belief in those cruel gods. The song said that Storm's End had been raised in ancient days by Duran, the first Storm King, who had won the love of the fair Eleni, the daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. On the night of their wedding, Eleni had yielded her maidenhood to a mortal's love and thus doomed herself to a mortal's death, and her grieving parents had unleashed their wrath and sent the winds and waters to batter down Duran's hold. His friends and brothers and wedding guests were crushed beneath collapsing walls or blown out to sea, but Eleni sheltered Duran within her arms, so he took no harm, and when the dawn came at last, he declared war upon the gods and vowed to rebuild. In the study of local legends, we see an emerging theme of house founders creating a seat. We saw it with Bran the Builder in the north, Corlos of the Castellis in the west, and here in the Stormlands, we find another. Yeah, and where Bran arranged defences against the others and Corlos craved gold, during God's grief sought shelter from the gods and elements themselves. When Catelyn visits the Stormlands in A Clash of Kings, she recalls Durin's tale. He was a mortal man, but fell in love with Eleni, daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. And such forbidden love angered Eleni's almighty parents, who ordered her to live and die like a mortal after she gave her maidenhood to Duran. Their wedding was wrought in tragedy as winds and waters were sent to collapse Duran's walls, crushing guests or blowing them out to sea. Duran was protected by the godly arms of Eleni, and he soon declared war upon her parents. He built five more castles, all smashed by the violent winds, until lords and small folk alike pleaded that he must return his love to the elements that now besieged the area. His seventh attempt was aided by a boy, some say a young boy, perhaps also joined by the children of the forest, and its stonecraft was so cunning the storms could no longer take their grip. They say the boy grew to be Brandon the Builder, and Duran became the first storm king in his seat aptly named Storm's End. Duran was the founder of House Durandon, and he lived and ruled for a thousand years with Eleni, according to some. However, the Durandans adopted a tradition of naming its first sons Duran, and so Archmaester Glaive's suggestion that the long reign was simply numerous descendants of the same name does make perfect sense. And the Stormlander mythology, that there are angry gods behind the wind and sea, two natural phenomena that are especially pertinent to the area, is not uncommon in real-world mythology. For example, in Norse mythology, such ideas are particularly prevalent as a culture similarly affected by wind and sea portrays, for example, Thor being able to control thunder and storms. And the Greeks had an array of similar deities, with Poseidon being the most powerful sea god. Themes of man and god as lovers are not uncommon in Greek mythology, as seen with goddess of love Aphrodite and mortal Anchises. They had a child together named Aeneas, who was thus a demigod. In what our story of Duran and Eleni insinuates is that their union brought the divine into the bloodline of House Durandon, who could have sourced fantastic pride in their alleged semi-divinity for ages to come. It doesn't come much better than being the descendants of a hero and a goddess, and so there must have been a regional boastfulness in the telling of this tale, and not only for Durand's stubborn defiance. With the elements of their forbidden love being enduring, her protecting him from wrath, and his unfailing determination to build a castle for them, 
we find Jiran and Eleni scoring highly romantically as well. Altogether, this is a great example of a local legend, one that reflects its place of origin and its people. The World Book alleges that Knights and lords of the Rainwood have roots as deep as the trees that shelter them and have oft proved themselves steadfast in battle, strong and stubborn and immovable. And this sounds not only like Storm's End, but like Duran himself, who created a seat and a legend in his own Stormlander image and set the invaluable precedent to never, ever give in to the harsh elements. And next we have more romance between a goddess and a mere mortal. Every place has its local heroes. Where I come from, the singers sing of Sir Galadon of Morn, the perfect knight. Sir Galahoo of what? Never heard of him. Why was he so bloody perfect? Sir Galadon was a champion of such valor that the maiden herself lost her heart to him. She gave him an enchanted sword as a token of her love. The just maid, it was called. No common sword could check her, nor any shield withstand her kiss. Sir Galadon bore the just maid proudly, but only thrice did he unsheathe her. He would not use the maid against a mortal man, for she was so potent as to make any fight unfair. The perfect knight? The perfect fool, he sounds like. What's the point of having some magic sword if you don't bloody well use it? Honor. The point is honor. Okay, so Nimble Dick brings about the subject of local legends. As we said in episode one, Chaucer often used a character's choice of storytelling to expose elements of their own character. And we see this dynamic at play here, not only with Dick, but also with Brienne of Tarth. Yeah, her tale contrasts with Nimble Dick's rather absurd stories, highlighting not just her own valuing of honor, but also the inherent difference between these two characters. When Nimble Dick laughs at Sir Galadon and calls him the perfect fool, he might as well be disparaging Brienne's background and entire way of life. Most of what George is trying to convey about this pair can be extrapolated from this brief passage about their favored myths, and so we can see the link between one's soul and persona and their mythology. Tarth is an island of great tradition, and so it's of little surprise that they had an exclusive legend. The island itself was a petty kingdom before the Stormlands swallowed it up with a marriage between Duran the Fair and the island's daughter. Morn, where Galadon is supposedly from, seems to have been an Andal seat befitting the tale, although traditions like the title of Evenstar, now carried by Brienne's father, seem to date back further. And the tale itself talks of one aspect of the Andal gods, the Maiden of the Seven, falling in love with a perfectly chivalrous hero, Galadon. So, the theme of love between a goddess and a man, as we saw with Duran and Eleni, and rather than a marriage, she offers a divine token instead, an enchanted blade called the Just Maid. Being the antithesis of Nimble Dick's heroes, the man chose not to wield it against mortal men, unsheathing it just three times, knowing its employment would cause an unchivalrous unfairness. This sends a clear message about having a chivalrous code among knights, and we do see such moral aspirations occasionally in story, such as Arthur Dane allowing the smiling knight to replace his broken sword during their duel. We can't say if Arthur had faith in Sir Galadon, but we can look at the esteem Brienne holds in the legends, and how it befits her standards of fairness and chivalry, ironically whilst being forbidden to embrace knighthood due to her sex. Still, Brienne meets the other criteria of true knighthood better than any character we can think of, and so here is a character who is partially driven by a legend she aspires to live up to. It's worth mentioning that her only brother died at age eight, 
His name was Galadon Tarth. So we can see that this legend is embedded deep in the Tarth familial psyche. The tale also becomes pertinent not just to Brienne's character, but to her plot as well. Nimbledick says Clarence Crabbe would have beheaded the perfect knight, who would be left to whisper the words, I should have used the magic sword. And when she gets to the whispers, she hears the imaginary heads whispering Dick's words, I should have used the magic sword. And she thus arms herself with Oathkeeper, which she soon uses to defy an ambush by three bloody mummers. George is weaving myths and plot together fantastically well here, with the seemingly superfluous storytelling with Dick in fact having a direct purpose to the plot. And by unsheathing her magic sword and using it to kill, Brienne shows that she's not prepared to live in fantasy. She's a warrior and knows that life is not a song as she bloodies Oathkeeper. Brienne must also see the parallels between the legend and her own situation of being given a magic sword by Jamie, whom she once thought of as looking like half a god. And as for a deeper meaning to the tale, we, as others do, see vague similarities between this and the legend of Lightbringer. Maester Hubert's insistence that it's not based on a legend from the Age of Heroes might be protesting too much, and so it's in the realm of possibilities that this tale could be modelled on Azor Ahai. It says the maiden lost her heart to Galadon, and in return he received an enchanted blade, so there are some shades of Azor and Nyssa here. It could be that this is the same story told through a modernised, romanticised, localised and pious lens. There might not be enough overlap between the two stories to make this a firm assertion, but it's certainly one worth considering, especially if you believe that George would want central myths to travel and evolve from place to place. One crucial difference, though, is that Galadon is said to have killed a dragon, something not attributed to Azor Ahai that we know of. Overall, the Stormlanders have a typically stubborn legend mirroring their own image, and similarly, Brienne of Tarth idolizes another legend reflecting hers. From the wedding guests who were blown off a cliff, we now head to a place where anybody can learn to fly from even greater heights. On to the Vale. The Vale of Arran, a long, wide, fertile valley, entirely ringed by the great grey-green peaks of the mighty mountains of the moon, is as rich as it is beautiful. Perhaps that was why the first Andal invaders chose to land there when they crossed the narrow sea beneath the banners of their gods. So far, every region we've seen has its own unique features that not only shape the way their residents live, but also fashion the nature of local legends. The Vale's uniqueness comes from its surrounding mountains, with its central seat, the Eyrie, built way up high. The people of the Vale must have looked up towards the mountaintops over the ages with a sense of awe, with those singers who made it to the Eyrie not needing to look far for inspiration. It's no surprise then that the Arran Sigil features a moon and a falcon, and thus we should expect a similar focus on winged ones and the surrounding wonder in their legends. Legend said that he had driven the first men from the Vale and flown to the top of the giant's lance on a huge falcon to slay the Griffin King. There were a hundred tales from his adventures. Little Robert knew them all so well he could have recited them from memory, but he liked to have them read to him all the same. In A Feast for Crows, whilst at the Eyrie with Sansa and Sweet Robin, we learn of the young boy's hero, the Winged Knight. Named as Artis Arryn, and not to be confused with the Andal Artis Arryn that we'll soon get to, this Artis is said to have lived thousands of years prior 
during the Age of Heroes. There are apparently hundreds of Winged Knight stories, and we only glimpse fragments in Feast for Crows and the World Book, but if these accounts are anything to go by, our Winged Knight flew on either a giant falcon or winged horse, fought alongside armies of eagles, and ascended to the top of the giant's lance to slay the Griffin King. We also learn that he drove the first men from the Vale, though this seems heavily anachronistic, as does his knighthood, and so it seems this Artis Aaron has been conflated with the other, who is credited for the same deed which we're going to discuss later. The Winged Knight even being an Aaron in itself is a perplexing claim, the line coming from Andalstock. And aside from this, we have rumours of the Winged Knight's friendship with giants and merlings, and his marriage to a child of the forest who died delivering his son. Altogether a vivid legend, where separating fact and fiction might be difficult, with such a basis of unbelievable tales and drawing from rather shallow accounts of the legend. What's important about these legends is the value they hold for Sweet Robin, Him and Sansa bond over storytelling, and the sickly, weakling child draws strength from his idol. The Wings Knight was brave, and so am I. I'm an Aaron. Yeah, the storytelling really seems to soothe and comfort Robin, the most fragile of characters. In his position, high up in the eerie with only his imagination to go on, one can see why tales of flying through the clouds with eagles and going on daring adventures would be appealing. Once again, George writes the legend around the situation. Further on into the book still, and we find this ostensibly disposable tale actually driving the plot, a technique we've noted multiple times. In the Winds of Winter, Elaine spoiler chapter, so spoiler alert for the next minute for that. Elaine 1 opens with Sansa reading The Winged Knight to Robin. She wants to aid the boy and has the marvellous idea of forming an order of protective knights for Robin called the Winged Knights. Here's an excerpt. The tourney, the prizes, the Winged Knights, it had all been her own notion. Lord Robert's mother had filled him full of fears, but he always took courage from the tales she read him of Sir Artis Arryn, the winged knight of legend, founder of his line. Why not surround him with winged knights? And so a tourney is heralded to form the winged knights, attracting people from all over the Vale. As such, George's legend is now central to the Vale storyline, going into the Winds of Winter, helping to create depth and intrigue, as well as being a vehicle for Sansa's ingenuity within her character development. Once again, we witness a story within a story, serving the main narrative, and the distant past directing the future. Finally, the notion that the hero rode a winged horse evokes Bellerophon riding Pegasus from Greek mythology. Archmaester Peristan's assertion that this could be a distorted story about a dragon rider from days of yore is certainly an interesting one. Who knows what used to go on back so many thousands of years ago? At the least, there might be some interesting dragon riding parallels in those tales of the Wings Knight, if they're given page time in the Winds of Winter. And we'll continue by going from one artist Aaron to the next. There is abundant historical evidence for the existence of Sir Artis Aaron, the Falcon Knight, the first Aaron King to rule over the mountain and vale. His victory over King Robar II at the Battle of the Seven Stars is well attested to, even though the details of that victory might have been somewhat embroidered in the centuries that followed. King Artis was undoubtedly a real man, albeit an extraordinary one. Sir Artis Arryn was the apparent founder of House Arryn and a warrior of great renown. Born under the giant's lance mountain as a true Valesman, he showed courage and leadership as a champion of multiple disciplines, not to mention possessing an ability to lead men. 
Yandel notes of him that he was beloved by all who fought beside him, bringing to mind a young Robert Baratheon. And on his shield he bore the moon and falcon, whilst a pair of falcon's wings decorated his silver war helm. The falcon knight, men called him, then as now, a stylization embedded in the House Aaron design ever since. He was chosen by the diminishing Andal contingent to lead against the resurgent First Men despite being of no royal stock. During the Battle for the Vale, or the Battle of the Seven Stars as it's known, First Men leader Robar Royce was outwitted by the Falcon Knight, who sent a fall guy wearing his armor onto the field to impersonate him, a la Garland Tyrell wearing Renly's armor at the Battle of Blackwater. The ruse worked, Whilst Royce fought the decoy, Artis Aaron sprung a tactical trap and rounded on the first men. The rest was a rout, with claims it was Aaron himself who slew Royce under the same shadow of the giant's lance that he had been born. The absolute truth of the matter may never be known, whilst what is certain is that the first men never recovered from this blow. Artis Aaron, the first of his name, was later crowned the first king of Mountain and Vale. His descendants continued the monarchic line until Aegon reduced them to Lords Paramount. However, whether Artis Aaron was truly the first of his name is a matter of confusion, as we've mentioned, there seems to be clear parallels between him and namesake Artis Aaron the Winged Knight as well as sharing an exact name, a similar moniker, and comparable deeds by winning the Vale, there seems to have been a conflation of these two figures. And on the subject of the Winged Knight's conflation with the later Artis Aaron, Yandel says, His name was certainly not Artis Aaron, for the Aarons came from pure Andal stock, and this Winged Knight lived and flew and fought many thousands of years before the first Andals came to Westeros. Like as not, it was the singers of the Vale who conflated these two figures, attributing the deeds of the legendary Winged Knight to the historic Falcon Knight, perhaps in order to curry favor with the real artist Aaron's successors by placing this great hero of the First Men amongst their forebears. And so we come back once again to the unreliable singers who change details and embellish stories for their own benefit, Myth meets history and becomes intertwined. This might be how George thinks some legends have evolved in our world. And by trying to further approve Artis I and associate him with a regional mythological figure, there's grounds for comparison with medieval Norman kings of England claiming descent from King Arthur in order to legitimize their rule over a conquered people. So, we're seeing time and again how important descendants from pivotal figures is within this pseudo-medieval culture for politics as well as pride. But our next legend has much more to do with sorrow and tragedy than politics and pride, as we'll see. Alyssa Aaron had seen her husband, her brothers, and all her children slain, and yet in life she had never shed a tear. So in death the gods had decreed that she would know no rest until her weeping watered the black earth of the vale where the men she had loved were buried. Elissa had been dead six thousand years now, and still no drop of the torrent had ever reached the valley floor far below. That the tale of Elissa Arryn comes to us in a Catelyn chapter is surely by design. As we experience the journey to the Eyrie, George employs the story within a story technique, ostensibly to add intrigue to the travelogue. And so he writes a legend that is inseparable from the local environs, a mountain and waterfall that Cat can see. Yeah, and it's a dark tragedy. Alyssa had witnessed her family murdered, yet never wept in life. The gods decreed that in death she would cry until her tears reached the soil of the vale where her family lay buried. Over the shoulder of the huge mountain Alyssa's tears flow, yet the waters pour from such a height that they turn to mist long before they ever reach the ground. 
And so, Alyssa is condemned to an eternity of weeping, not just in the mountain and river, but in her stone rendering within the eyrie which Bronn utilises to help defeat Sir Vardis Egan. The truth of the tale is not known, with maesters dating the tale as six, four and two thousand years old. Despite the dating issues and the fantastical elements, there lies a dark story. Yeah, it's interesting to consider that Alyssa might really have seen her family brutalized and remain stoic to the dismay of the small folk who might have wanted to see her show emotion. It's unclear whether her stoicism was a public display or if she wouldn't weep even in private. In either case, everyone deals with tragedy differently, and so the gods punishing a victim like this does appear to be rather harsh. However, perhaps the small folk were both irked with Alyssa's public withholding of emotion and looking for a romanticised way to explain the surrounding environment and some singer of yore might have connected the two and so birthed the legend of Alyssa's tears. It's certainly a poignant tale to both readers and characters, and amidst the awe of natural wonder, Catelyn thinks, She wondered how large a waterfall her own tears would make when she died. Yeah, this tale holds particular significance for her in that, to some extent at least, Alyssa Aaron foreshadows aspects of Catelyn's demise. While not a like-for-like parallel, Catelyn similarly loses much of her family in a short space of time. Remembering she doesn't realize that some of them are secretly still alive, she does cry, yet she battles to maintain a stoic veneer through some awful times, and finally, as Lady Stoneheart, She bears permanent tears on her face from the horrendous self-inflicted gouging during her descent into madness at the Red Wedding. Upon her resurrection, Westeros has a tragic weeping woman once again. So although not a carbon copy, Catelyn's story relates to Alyssa's in the magnitude of its tragedy and other aspects, and so the legend provides added depth on a reread with the hindsight of Catelyn's demise. Whether Lady Stoneheart will one day come to rest or struggle in torment like Alyssa's River of Tears remains to be seen. From the flight of the winged knight to the endlessness of the waterfall, the Vale's legends are evidence of the impact of an awesome environment on a local culture. And we go from falcons to fish next as we survey the legends of the Riverlands. During the long centuries when the first men reigned supreme in Westeros, countless petty kingdoms rose and fell in the Riverlands. Their histories, entwined and embroidered with myth and song, are largely forgotten save for the names of a few legendary kings and heroes whose deeds are recorded on weathered stones in runes, whose meaning are even now disputed at the Citadel. The history of the Riverlands is rife with both glory and tragedy. There was tremendous change beginning with the arrival of the Andals, and the World Book notes that much of the rich first man history has been lost. It says, Their histories, entwined and embroidered with myth and song, are largely forgotten. This might explain why their legends are relatively scarce, with only one being of any renown to the reader. And the main geographical feature of the region is obviously its rivers and bays in the mouth of the Trident, which are used for defence, transportation and food. It's no surprise then that the most famous legend of the Riverlands revolves around a natural pool. You are no knight. I know you. You are Florian the Fool. I am, my lady. As great a fool as ever lived, and as great a knight as well. A fool and a knight? I've never heard of such a thing. Sweet lady, all men are fools, and all men are knights, where women are concerned. 
In our introduction, we mentioned a trip to Tintagel, a place that had embraced the legend of King Arthur to the point of becoming fashioned by the tales. In the Riverlands, there's a place which has gone even further by naming itself after an aspect of a legend. Maidenpool, as we learn in A Storm of Swords, was named for the pool where Florian the Fool first glimpsed Jonquil bathing with her sisters. The reader imagines a place of purity, of great natural and physical beauty in the scene. However, Maidenpool is thrice sacked during the War of the Five Kings by wolves, by lions, and by outlaws. By the time we get to see the town, as Jamie, Brienne, and Cleos Frey travel through it, the environment is desolate, burned and ruined, insinuating terrible atrocities have taken place. Our trio glimpse the famed pool, and whilst recounting the beautiful legend, Jamie sees it full of corpses and death. So in this instance, George uses the enchantment of local myth to provide juxtaposition for the horrific reality of what Maidenpool has become. It's noted how the pool was now so choked with rotting corpses that the water had turned into a murky grey-green soup. And from there, the ironically jovial Jamie breaks into a song, singing Six Maids in a Pool. Six maids there were in a spring-fed pool is all we get before Brienne interjects, and, given the context, the song is almost certainly related to Florian and Jonquil. Okay, so what do we know about the tale? There was a decent amount of exposition in The Hedge Knight, with the puppeteer Tanzel Tootall performing Florian and Jonquil, Plus we have tidbits from Sansa, Brienne and Bran, who we ought to name the Three Dreamers. Embroidering together all the snippets concerning this legend, we get something like this. Florian first saw Jonquil bathing in the pool with her sisters, surely inspiring the aforementioned song. He was plain or unattractive and not of noble birth. He was a great fool and a great knight. It seems to be a romantic love story centered around Jonquil's acceptance of Florian's unusual duality. He had a famous sword, was one of the best warriors, and wore armor made of motley. He won victories against terrible foes, one of which seems to be a giant. The legend is both sad and sweet, so we have to consider if there's a tragic element amidst the romance. Okay, and as for a deeper meaning, there seems to be allegory concerning this duality of Florian's. In the play, we get a key line. All men are fools, and all men are knights, where women are concerned. The insinuation seems to be that there is a jester and a warrior in the heart of every man, and both surface when they fall in love. There is an inherent brave and aggressive side, contrasting with a foolish or playful side residing in man. The story might challenge the notion that there are oppositional aspects of personality, instead purporting that they can coexist within one good soul. Florian the Fool might embody this truth with his lower birth and homely appearance, furthering the tale's pertinence to the everyman. With these themes likely underpinning those of love and honour, it's not difficult to understand the appeal of the legend in story. And from a writing perspective, Florian makes for an interesting character. In literature, there are many tropes associated with fools, usually revolving around speaking hard truths or having unexpected wisdoms, with Shakespeare being notable for including fools in many of his works. But The Warrior Fool is an interesting play on the standard dichotomy, as Jonquil says, A fool and a knight? I've never heard of such a thing. Yes, so as far as we know, this might be an original amalgamation by George. The anachronistic nature of this Age of Heroes knight might seem bothersome, in that his knighthood is so central to his story, yet it's not hard to imagine there were brave warriors amongst the first men who had their own version of a chivalric code, even if unspoken. It's difficult to say if the first men had fools, but if they didn't, the timeline of this tale becomes confusing, because we know the naming of Maidenpool 
occurred before the Andal invasion. Perhaps George relishes such confusing ambiguity. Anyway, speaking of brave warriors and brilliant fools, brings us to a character who tries to be both, but is actually neither. Sir Dantas Hollard was the modern version of Florian for a time, a drunken knight from an ailing house fashioned into a court jester by Joffrey after, fortunately for Dantos, Sansa intervened to save him from being drowned in a cask of wine. As a royal fool, Dantos then has an enviable view of the Red Keep, and Littlefinger takes advantage by employing him as a go-between to Sansa Stark. Being both a knight and a fool, and with promises of escape, it's not long before Sansa starts calling him her Florian. However, to her dismay, her apparent hero is a drunken, lecherous slob. Dontos covered his mouth to stifle a burp. Gods preserve you, my little jonquil. He was growing weepy. The wine did that to him. Give your Florian a kiss now, a kiss for luck. He swayed towards her. Sansa dodged the wet, groping lips, kissed him lightly on an unshaven cheek, and bid him good night. It took all her strength not to weep. Sansa's a character who's been very susceptible to the charm of myths and legends, and who thought Florian to be the greatest knight of all. Yet, as we've discussed, life is not a song for her, which she's had to learn amidst the ruin of her family. Sansa's Florian being a gross, slobbering dolt is yet another wake-up call on her journey away from idealism. As with Maidenpool, the beauty of the legend contrasts with the dismal reality of the War of the Five Kings. And Elena even seems to paraphrase Florian when she argues, All men are fools, if truth be told, but the ones in Motley are more amusing than the ones with crowns. Overall, the theme of a warrior fool is enduring and speaks to characters and readers alike, despite the relatively minimal exposition of this every man and his love. Next up, there's a quick roundup of the lesser known legends of the Riverlands. While singers and storytellers may regale us with colorful tales of Artos the Strong, Florian the Fool, Nine Finger Jack, Shara the Witch Queen, and the Green King of the God's Eye, the very existence of such personages must be questioned by the serious scholar. The World Book outlines four other legendary figures, and once again we have little to go on. Artos the Strong was very likely strong. Nine-Fingered Jack sounds like he's been throwing axes with the Ironborn, and Shara the Witch Queen sounds like an intriguing magical character. Whether George knows of the deeds of these characters, or whether their names are just cultural shading, remains to be seen. However, the final name, the Green King of the God's Eye, at least tells us of the legend's locale. The God's Eye is the great lake nearby Harrenhal, containing the mysterious Isle of Faces. This is where the pact was signed between the First Men and the Children of the Forest, ending their ancient feud. The Sacred Order of the Green Men was formed to watch over the Isle of Faces. Here we want to save a section on the Green Men as part of a future episode, because it really is a mythology of a different sort. But here let's contemplate that the names God's Eye, Green Men, and Isle of Faces all evoke green seeing. Having a strange, perhaps magical island in the middle of a huge lake must have fed into local folklore in the Riverlands, and we wonder what the Green King's association was, noting the green in his title. Overall, the Riverlands myths give us a look at localized legend that's important to one specific area, with Florian and Jonquil and Maidenpool, yet we unfortunately don't see very much else. It would have been nice to know these scarcely mentioned figures and discover which legends are important to the Riverlanders as a whole. Next up, 
expect more legends of the local variety as we travel through the Crownlands. When he was not singing, Nimble Dick would talk, regaling them with tales of Crackclaw Point. Every gloomy valley had its lord, he said, the lot of them united only by their mistrust of outsiders. In their veins, the blood of the first men ran dark and strong. To hear him tell it, the men of Crackclaw Point had watered their pine trees with blood. The Crownlands were never a sovereign nation, and King's Landing was built within relatively recent history. As such, George has focused masses of history on the area, but not much in the way of folklore from the city. However, in A Feast for Crows, we realise that the Crownlands are positively brimming with local folklore, if you know where to look. When we travel off the beaten track through Crackclaw Point with local guide Nimble Dick Crab, we get a true taste of local flavor in a sequence where folklore is deeply connected to the narrative. We focused on the humorous side of these tales in our Brienne episode, that's number 13, but now let's consider their value as legends. Best we keep a watch tonight, milady place like this, there might be squishers. Squishers? Monsters. They look like men till you get close, but their heads are too big and they got scales where a proper man's got air. Fish belly white they are, with webs between their fingers. They're always damp and fishy smelling, but behind these blubbery lips, they got rows of green teeth sharp as needles. Some say the first men killed them all. But don't you believe it? They come by night and steal bad little children, padding along on them webbed feet with a little squish squish sound. The girls they keep to breed with, but the boys, they eat the boys, tearing at them with those sharp green teeth. Podrick, they'd eat you boy. They'd eat you raw. If they try, I'll kill them. You try that, you just try. Squishers don't die easy. The story of the Squishers is a local legend told by Nimble Dick Crab. We've always found this sequence to be one of the funniest in A Song of Ice and Fire, with many humorous details being conveyed until it's eventually revealed that Dick is taking great satisfaction in scaring young Podrick Payne during their journey. We presume the Squishers folklore is embellished by Nimble Dick, but in fact, based on the local law from Cracklaw Point. The Squishers are another race, one from the sea, perhaps an evolved race of fish beings. To find the inspiration for such monsters, we have to look no farther than, once again, horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, who seems to have left a large imprint on George, given the plethora of references and stylistic comparisons. Lovecraft wrote a novella in 1931 entitled The Shadow Over Innsmouth. The narrator is a student who travels to the mysterious seaport of Innsmouth, where a local resident tells him a horrifying story of aquatic monsters who can interbreed with humans to produce amphibian hybrids. Does this sound somewhat familiar? Yes, I think it does. Here's a description of Lovecraft's Deep Ones. I think their predominant color was a grayish green, though they had white bellies. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their backs were scaly. Their forms vaguely suggested the arthropoid, while their heads were the heads of fish with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. Okay, so with the similar descriptions, like the white bellies and the assertion they like to interbreed with humans, we can see the uncanny parallels between Deep Ones and Squishers. In fact, George even included mentions of the Deep Ones in the World Book as an ancient race of queer misshapen half-men sired by creatures of the salt seas upon human women. And so the connection between them and Squishers if either truly existed, is plain for the reader to see. 
Now, H.P. Lovecraft was known for mysterious horror, absurd creatures, and using the power of the unknowing and unknowable as a literary device. George takes influence and replicates the essence within his established world, whilst also highlighting the darkly humorous underbelly of such absurdity. The power of the unknowable is worked with great effect, given his presumed goal of impenetrable and mystic legends in this case. Where in Crackclaw Point? The whispers? You had a Clarence Crabber course? No. No, Sir Clarence Crabber said. I got his blood in me. He was eight feet tall and so strong he could uproot pine trees with one hand and chuck them half a mile. No horse could bear his weight, so he rode an aurochs. What does he have to do with his smuggler's cove? Well, his wife was a woods witch. Whenever Sir Clarence killed a man, he'd fetch his head back home and his wife would kiss it on the lips and bring it back to life. Lords they were, and wizards, and famous knights and pirates. One was the King of Duskendale. They gave old Crab good counsel. Being they were just heads, they couldn't talk real loud, but they never shut up neither. When you're an head, talking's all you got to pass the day. So Crab's Keep got named the Whispers. Still is, though it's been a ruin for a thousand years. Lonely place, the Whispers. So, Clarence Crab is a local legend Nimble Dick is fiercely proud of, even claiming some distant kinship. He's not perturbed by the fantastical elements of Crab's legend, such as the claim that the giant man threw trees half a mile. Instead, Dick relishes these details like a child, making him, with the hindsight of his demise, a truly likable character. Yes, we like him a lot. And as we heard in the quote, Crab took the heads of his enemies home which were revived by his magical wife and proceeded to offer good counsel. This legend seems to have been inspired by the loneliness of a natural phenomenon. The whispers turn out to be waves breaking on the rocks in the place of the same name. And as we mentioned earlier, the waves and talk of whispers stays with Brienne as she imagines hearing a voice tell her to use her magic sword. And so, Dick's storytelling saved the lives of both her and Pod. And the notion of talking heads has roots in real-world mythology and perhaps history. The practice of beheading enemies as trophies is called the cult of the head and associated with the Celts. There are tales in Irish Celtic mythology of disembodied heads which strangely continue to speak after their death. Conair Moore was a high king of Ireland who asked his guard for a glass of water whilst they were under attack. Two men rushed in and beheaded him, and when his guard came back, the head continued to drink the water and praise the loyalty of his friend. And after the Battle of Allen, the Leinstermen were celebrating their victory over the men of Ulster. Beathgalax was sent to the battlefield to obtain a trophy head. He hears beautiful singing from a severed head. The head performs for the impressed king, and so is magically rejoined to his body as a reward. This legendary phenomena from Celtic lore is thought to have influenced the myth of Bran the Blessed, the British king who could talk despite decapitation and whose head was buried facing France to ward off invasion. And Clarence Crabbe himself seems to be modelled on American folk hero Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan is a legend in the tall tale tradition who goes around with his giant blue ox hefting trees as a legendary lumberjack with super strength. Altogether, with elements taken from Paul Bunyan and this rich history of ritual decapitation and talking heads from Celtic and British mythology, we're sure George was aware of both when designing Clarence Crab. Crackbones fought a dragon too, but he didn't need no magic sword. He just tied its neck in a knot, so every time it breathed fire, it roasted its own arse. 
And what did this Crackbones do when Aegon and his sisters came? He was dead. My lady must know that. Crackbones is a briefly mentioned yet memorable figure from Crackclot Point. Nimbledick seems astonished that Brienne is ignorant of his existence during this amusing tale of tying a dragon's neck in a knot in order to make it roast its own arse. This tale is so overtly amusing, we can be sure of Nimbledick's purpose as a provider of comic relief during their journey. Yeah, and aside from the humour, Dick also becomes competitive and defensive about his beloved legends. He imagines that Crab would wipe his ass with Brienne's hero, for example. This not only underlines the strange yokelness in him, but highlights the importance of legends to characters in small towns. We grow to realise that Dick is a broke, desperate man who has little to be prideful for. His locality and its legends are almost all the man has, and so who could begrudge him of this sense of pride? Bren and Dick's personalities and legends couldn't be more different, yet they are both united by their self-definition via their respective local legends. Overall, these folktales bring humour, depth and local flavour to Crackclaw Point, reminding us of the value of local legend, drawing from a variety of mythologies and tying the stories to the outer narrative once again. Their respective mythological beliefs provide a viewpoint into the very essence of Brienne and Nimble Dick's characters, and who wouldn't want ringside tickets to watch Clarence Crabbe fight the Squisher King? Yes, an historic match-off according to Dick, <laughs> and it also indicates that there might be an underwater monarchic system. And speaking of things under the sea, the Ironborn have a few things to say about that next. Many legends have come down to us through the millennia of the salt kings and reavers who made the sunset see their own. Men as wild and cruel and fearless as any who have ever lived. The Ironborn are so removed from the people of the mainland that there are some who think they are a separate entity altogether, neither first man nor andal. Drowned priests have been known to make claims such as this. We came from beneath the seas, from the watery halls of the drowned god who gave us dominion over land and earth. The Ironborn's unique faith gives them a different perspective on themselves and the world around them. We should expect their legends to reflect this, and given our discoveries about locality thus far, we should see what can be extrapolated about the lifestyles and environs of these folk by the legends they embrace. Central to their culture is a conflict of identity and tradition. Should they follow the old way or the new? Legends are old in their very nature, and so expect to see them play a role in such political matters. Naga had been the first sea dragon, the mightiest ever to rise from the waves. She fed on krakens and leviathans and drowned whole islands in her wrath, yet the Grey King had slain her and the drowned god had changed her bones to stone so that men might never cease to wonder at the courage of the first of kings. Naga's ribs became the beams and pillars of his long haul, just as her jaws became his throne. For a thousand years and seven he reigned here. Here he took his mermaid wife and planned his wars against the storm god. From here he ruled both stone and salt, wearing robes of woven seaweed and a tall, pale crown made from Naga's teeth. But that was in the dawn of days, when mighty men still dwelt on earth and sea. The hall had been warmed by Naga's living fire, which the Grey King had made his thrall. On its walls hung tapestries woven from silver seaweed most pleasing to the eyes. The Grey King's warriors had feasted on the bounty of the sea at a table in the shape of a great starfish, while seated upon thrones carved from mother of pearl. 
Following on from Nimble Dick's overt and desperate pride in his local legends, we have the Grey King bringing about similar emotion in Aaron Greyjoy. It says the sight of Nagger's four and forty monstrous stone ribs rising from the earth made Aaron's heart beat faster. As the legend of the Grey King is exposed to the reader, it's punctuated by Aaron's lamentations that the once glorious Ironborn are now weak. When we saw George speak at Balticon last year, he said that after suffering sexual abuse from his brother Euron, Aaron Dampere sought refuge in religion and tradition. The tale of the great king and Naga as outlined before the king's moo and expanded upon in the world book is designed to be as enduring as the sea dragon's ribs. It's the origin story of the Ironborn, and we can see why a desperate Aaron would hold the tale so sacrosanct. The legend comes from the Age of Heroes and describes the Grey King as a dragon slayer. This is becoming a common trope in local lore, as we've seen, yet the twist here is that it was a sea dragon. This hero also brought fire to Earth by taunting the Storm King into firing a thunderbolt in anger, and he allegedly built the first longship and taught men to weave nets and sails. Despite many such accomplishments, the Grey King's finest was said to be his slaying of Naga, a beast so gigantic, it was said to feed on leviathans and giant krakens and drown whole islands in her wrath. After the Grey King built his hall around the dragon's bones, the drowned god was suitably impressed enough to turn the ribs to stone to immortalize the hero's accomplishments for the awe of future generations. The Grey King battled the storm god and made a mermaid his wife so his sons and daughters might live above the waves or beneath them as they chose. The Grey King resided in his hall for over a thousand years until his skin turned as grey as his hair and eyes which earned him his name, bringing to mind the Undying Ones and other accounts of magical longevity such as Greenseer's. When the Grey King had grown sufficiently grey, he took leave and descended down to the watery halls of the Drowned God. And leaving a hundred sons behind created a terrible succession war where rampant king slaying left just 16 sons to divide the islands between them. The fact that we're told of the Grey King story in the world book before the king's mood is explained gives added depth to this institution that was established to resolve succession claims and significantly traditionally took place amidst Naga's bones. All the great houses of the Ironborn claim descent from the Grey King and his sons, save the Good Brothers, who claim their descent from the Grey King's own Leal Brother, get it, Good Brother, and so this legend shares parallels with Garth Greenhand, who aided Reachman in sustenance pertinent to their environment, growing and harvesting. The Ironborn, being islanders and seafarers, were similarly taught relevant skills such as netting by their legendary forebear. However, the Grey King differs in that it's a tale which seems to reward conflict, bravery and fearlessness, in that the slaying of a great beast is the cornerstone of his achievements and those supposed bones stand to this day. Some fans wonder if the story of Naga is fantastical, with the bones, in fact, being the remnants of an ancient weirwood grove. Yeah, here we have this line. Naga rose from the earth like the trunks of great white trees. And next, there's this description. Monstrous stone ribs rose from the earth like the trunks of great pale trees. Given that... Weirwoods turn to stone after a time, we think is an interesting case. There's also the staff of the famous priest of the drowned god, Galon Whitestaff, so called for the tall carved staff he carried everywhere to smite the ungodly. The world book tells us that in some tales his staff was made of weirwood, but in others it's from one of Naga's bones. 
And it's an interesting repeated connection there between Naga's bones and pale wood or weirwood. If Naga's bones were a weirwood grove and the Grey King chose that as his hall in which to exercise his longevity, who's to say, donning our tinfoil hat here, that the Grey King couldn't have been a green seer with that legend evolving over time? Furthermore, the assertion the Grey King carved the first longship from the hard pale wood of Ig, a demon tree who fed on human flesh, again brings to mind weirwoods and I seem to remember our friend's history of Westeros wondering if there was an insinuation of weirwood longships. Incidentally, Ig seems to be a reference to Yggdrasil, an immense mythical tree that connects the nine worlds in Norse cosmology that itself might have inspired weirwoods which share similarities such as their implied connection to time, fate, and destiny. And the passage concerning the marrying of mermaids in order for the Grey King's descendants to be able to live on land or in sea, linking the notions of a watery afterlife, seems to revolve around reassuring the primitive seafarers that the Ironborn were back then against having fear of the sea. Seafaring comes with great risks such as storms and drowning, and the Ironborn needed to be fearless on the waves and unafraid of drowning. In the modern story, we see the manifestation of that mindset as Victarion proudly fights at sea, wearing plate armor heavy enough to sink him if he slipped. Incidentally, the Vikings believed in halls of the dead, such as Valhalla, which sounds somewhat similar to the Ironborn's watery halls of afterlife. So, overall, the Grey King and Naga is a legend which speaks to the uniqueness in culture and situation of the Viking-esque Ironborn, causing an immense sense of pride which permeates for thousands of years and into the current timeline and is intertwined deeply with their religious beliefs. Aaron Greyjoy's unflinching awe at the tale underlines that this mythos is taken very seriously by the priests of the Drowned God, and Maester Yendel confirms that he's not alone among the pious Ironborn. We wonder if behind this celebrated mythos there might have been a man who revolutionized shipbuilding for the Ironborn, an expert sailor and captain whose adoration by his people snowballed over time. Either way, Aaron is wrong when he says... Only Naga's bones endured to remind the Ironborn of all the wonder that had been. Thousands of years later, the story is still there, just like Naga's bones. Torgon Greyiron was the king's eldest son, but the king was old and Torgon restless, so it happened that when his father died, he was raiding along the Manda from his stronghold on Greyshield. His brothers sent no word to him, but instead quickly called a king's moot, thinking that one of them would be chosen to wear the driftwood crown. But the captains and the kings chose Uragon Goodbrother to rule instead. The first thing the new king did was command that all the sons of the old king be put to death. And so they were. After that, men called him Bad Brother, though in truth they'd be no kin of his. He ruled for almost two years. Torgon came home and said the king's moot was unlawful since he had not been there to make his claim. Bad Brother had proved to be as mean as he was cruel and had few friends left upon the isles. The priests denounced him the lords rose against him, and his own captains hacked him into pieces. Torgon the Latecomer became the king and ruled for 40 years. The first High King of all the Iron Islands was Eurus Greyiron, chosen by Kingsmu at Old Wick and crowned with the Driftwood Crown by the legendary prophet Galon Whitestaff. And so it continued in the Iron Islands during the Age of Heroes, with Archmaester Herrig counting 111 men chosen to wear the driftwood crown by King's Moot during what the World of Ice and Fire calls a Golden Age for the Iron Islands. 
Of course, that number is impossible to prove, and Yandel notes that it is incomplete and rife with contradictions. But it's perhaps safe to note that for many centuries, with the exception of a brief challenge by Euras Grey Iron Sun, Ironborn captains and the Salt and Rock kings of the islands gathered in a tradition known as a king's moot to choose their high king at Old Wick. Yeah, during this time, kingship by inheritance, which was widely practiced in the Greenlands, was rejected by the Ironborn in favor of their more democratic process, always presided over by a priest of the drowned god. But late in the Age of Heroes, at a time when Ironborn fortunes were on the decline overall, a high king named Uragon III Grey Iron died unexpectedly. And Uragon's sons hurriedly called a king's moot while their eldest brother Torgon was away raiding, thinking that one of them would be chosen to succeed their father. In this they were mistaken, and a man called Eurothon Goodbrother was chosen instead. The first thing this Goodbrother did was command the deaths of the old king's sons. What followed was a two-year reign characterised by such cruelty he became known as Bad Brother. And when at last Torgon Greyiron returned to the Iron Islands, he declared that the king's moot had been invalid because He had not been present to press his claim. Having realized their mistake, small folk, priests, and lords alike supported Torgon, while Urathon's own captains hacked him to pieces. Torgon, ever after known as the latecomer, became king and ruled for 40 years, the first high king of the Ironborn not to have been chosen by Kingsmoot. And when Torgon passed on, His dying wish was that his son Euragon should succeed him as Euragon IV, who in turn named his great-nephew Euron Greyiron, the Salt King of Orkmont, to succeed him as High King of the Iron Islands. But the priests were determined that their power in the selection process should not be ignored for the third generation, lest it be forever eroded, and so called a king's moot to assemble on Old Wick. Yet when hundreds of captains, salt kings and rock kings had arrived, Euron set loose his axemen upon them and slaughtered more than 50 priests and 13 petty kings. Known afterwards as Euron Red Hand, Euron Grey Iron ruled the Iron Islands for more than 20 years and his sons and descendants after him, all wearing crowns of iron and styling themselves kings of the Iron Islands. The power of the king's moot was broken with that massacre, and the salt kings and rock kings passed into history as well. Institutionalized primogeniture became a feature of Ironborn culture, and interestingly, it's Euron Red Hand whom Balon Greyjoy invokes when he declares his intent to seize the crown he had long coveted by making war upon the North in the War of the Five Kings. So the story of Torgon the Latecomer is first mentioned in A Dance with Dragons as an important lesson to Asher Greyjoy, who immediately thinks of her brother Theon, absent from the recent King's Moot, where her uncle Euron, a bad brother if ever there was one, was chosen king. Many readers think the Torgon tale will be significant to Theon's arc going forward, even if only as it applies to how his sister Asher might view his future. Yeah, there's definitely a chance that Theon could press his claim, or at least be encouraged to do so, by his sister. And given the precedent, we think there's a good chance he could gain the necessary support in the right circumstances. So this is a great example of George using world building in a way that could have real significance to the plot going forward. Yeah, we're seeing this time and time again now, aren't we? And as for the larger question of whether Torgon the Latecomer ever existed, we want to note that, as this is a tale from the Age of Heroes, it's just very difficult to say with any certainty whether he's an actual historical character or if we're simply dealing with a legend that explains an important cultural development. 
One thing is certain, this story embodies the conflict between old ways and new. And speaking of Torgon, he has a lesser known namesake who is one of several other obscure Ironborn legends mentioned in the world of Ice and Fire. Thus we hear the likes of Torgon the Terrible, Jorl the Whale, Dagon Drum the Necromancer, Hrothgar of Pike and his Kraken Summoning Horn, and Ragged Ralph of Old Wick. So the World Book tells us that the Iron Islands are full of cruel and fearless legends, and we get a quick blast of a few names. Torgon the Terrible, if he's anything like Ivan the Terrible, might not be the nicest person you could ever meet, and Yule the Whale might not be the thinnest. And Dagon Drum the Necromancer may well be another reference to an H.P. Lovecraft story, one of Lovecraft's earliest stories, actually, the first one that refers to the Deep Ones. In Lovecraft, Dagon is a reference to the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon the Fish God, and with his alleged necromancy, Dagon Drum might have been some magician or Kyburn-esque scientist. Yes, a Kyburn of the Iron Isles. That's very interesting, isn't it? And another character, Rothgar of Pike, has a name lifted from the Beowulf legend and Scandinavian lore. He also has a Kraken horn, which is quite exciting, remembering that in the current story, Salador San claims how Celtigar have a similar Kraken horn. He says, A magic horn to summon Krakens from the deep. Very useful such a horn would be to pull down Tyroshi and other vexing creatures. So could we see a Kraken being summoned in the story? We sure hope so. And we would love to know how old Hrothgar employed his Kraken. And we also have Ragged Ralph of Old Wick, who sounds like he could do with a new wardrobe. Maybe he was so full of faith for the Drowned God, he didn't care much for his appearance. And finally, we have Balon Blackskin. It says, Most infamous of all was Balon Blackskin, who fought with an axe in his left hand and a hammer in his right. No weapon made of man could harm him, it was said. Swords glanced off and left no mark, and axes shattered against his skin. Okay, so, Balon and his invincible skin. It sounds like it could be a romanticised way of describing a man wearing some strong black armour. Perhaps the locals hadn't seen it before and thought it looked like a second skin, which became literal skin in the telling. And that's your lot for Legends of the Ironborn, where we've considered the logic of making your people fearless to the danger inherent in your culture, and seen how that manifests in the intertwining world of religion, legend, and even politics. We've also seen how a hard, isolated society breeds suitably tough and unique legends. From one individual culture to another, up next, we'll navigate to Dorn. <laughs> Only a Dornish man can ever truly know Dawn, it is said. The southernmost of the Seven Kingdoms is also the most inhospitable, and the strangest to the eyes of any man raised in the Reach, or the Westerlands, or King's Landing. For Dawn is different, in more ways than can be told. Dorne is where the first men first set foot, and so, in some ways, is the most historic region. The fact there are a scant supply of Dornish legends is a real shame given the uniqueness and intrigue of the area. To Westerosi eyes, the strangeness of the landscapes in Dorne are matched only by the quirks of their culture. For generations, the Dornish have been outliers amidst the Seven Kingdoms, proudly warring with the dragons and styling their leaders as princes and princesses. And when they talk about legends, it's almost always of one woman and her fleet.
Nymeria's blood is in me, along with that of Mors Martel, the Dornish lord she married. On the day they wed, Nymeria fired her ships, so her people would understand that there could be no going back. Most were glad to see those flames, for the voyagings had been long and terrible before they came to dawn, and many more had been lost to storm disease and slavery. The legend of Nymeria is an origin story of sorts. She might not be the demigoddess progenitor type, but she certainly had a remarkable and lasting effect on Dornish culture. As princess of the Rhoynish river city of Nisar, she faced an impossible battle. Around a thousand years before the books begin, the Valyrian Empire was thriving, but required the toil of slaves, and so the dragon lords continued with their culture of conquest and enslavement. Okay, so what we're going to do is cover the Essosi side of this tale in great detail in our Eastern Legends episode. But for now, and in short, Nymeria knew her people would be conquered and enslaved, and so she gathered every boat in the Rhoyne and set sail to find a new home in a giant exodus. After years of disaster, disease, famine and enslavement by pirates, the Rhoynar looked doomed. Until Nymeria took her 10,000 ships to dawn. Then it says... The battered, tattered remainder of the 10,000 ships sailed west with Princess Nymeria. This time she made for Westeros. After so much wandering, her ships were even less seaworthy than when she had first departed Mother Rhoyne. The fleet did not arrive in Dorne complete. Even now there are isolated pockets of Rhoynar on the stepstones, claiming descent from those who were shipwrecked. Other ships, blown off course by storms, made for Lys or Tyrosh, giving themselves up to slavery in preference to a watery grave. The remaining ships made landfall on the coast of Dorne, near the mouth of the river Greenblood, not far from the ancient sandstone walls of Sunspear, seat of House Martell. So the story so far is a timeless one. It's the tale of asylum seekers. Here, this contingent is comprised mainly of women, children and elderly folk. With the omission of able men, George made this group more vulnerable in spite of the warrior woman culture. He put them through living hell as the horror and fear of their initial displacement from their home is repeatedly compounded by murderers, rapists and exploiters. And there have been refugees fleeing and seeking asylum all throughout human history, and George is inviting us to empathize with the Rhoynar and perhaps to consider our own position on this complex issue. In this story, the Dornish almost banished the refugees, wanting to drive them back into the sea from which they came, which would certainly have meant their doom. We're sure you all can think of numerous parallels of desperate or even failed asylum seekers throughout history right up to the present time. Unfortunately for the remaining Rhoynar, Moors Martel at once saw an opportunity in them and gave his heart to Nymeria. With the former, Moors, perhaps even cynically, saw the use of many women, some warriors and some with sons that had now grown, to his cause. The Rhoynar also brought with them cultural boons, much needed water magics to revive dead streams and areas, and advanced arts, skills and crafts. George is conveying that in no uncertain terms, this ragtag desperate bunch provided cultural enrichment to those who received them. And Martel's people embraced the change and married into the Rhoynar when Moors wed Nymeria. In an act both symbolic and physical, she then burned the Rhoynar ships. Our wanderings have come to an end, and here we shall live. Using the aforementioned militaristic and cultural boon, Moors and Nymeria set out to defeat Moors' enemies in dawn and eventually succeeded leaving the ruling house to be known by its true title, 
House Nymeros Martel of Sunspear. Nymeria and her exodus left a huge imprint on Dornish culture, from social order to the strong Dornish female archetype, to the more equal balance between male and female in marriage and inheritance, to the title Prince, Princess of Dorn. Arya Stark names her direwolf Nymeria, and Ariane thinks of Nymeria when she suspects Quentin is being unfairly elevated. There are songs and books about Nymeria in universe, and Danny thinks of her in A Dance with Dragons, remembering that she might have her own version of the 10,000 ships soon, given she has to transport a mega army over to Westeros. And in the world book, we get a large section on Nymeria. Although it's apparently an historical account, this is a long time ago and many question the veracity of her story, perhaps placing it in the realm of legend. So whether the 10,000 ships are literal or just another way of saying a large boatload of boats, it's up to the reader to decide. We will say that the world book's proposition that the figure included all manner of minor river boats found up and down the Rhoyne does make it seem a little less far-fetched. What is certain, though, is that Princess Nymeria brought her people to Dorne and found a mutually beneficial way to at once protect them and benefit her new home, and she didn't have to sell off her children to disgusting pirates to do so, as was proposed. As such, she is remembered as a great leader, and you only have to look at the later friction between Dorne and the Valyrian Targaryens to see her indomitable spirit in action long after her years. Okay, so with wrapping up Dawn, that brings us to the end of our look at Southern Legends. We've shown how George repeatedly built the legends around the people and their unique situation, both to emulate real-world folklore and to help define and shape regional identities as distinct from one another. This all adds up to a believable world full of the verisimilitude we talked about in the northern episode and infuses locales with great character. The myths and legends of the South undoubtedly add depth and flavor to Westeros, and with the lores we can see how history can come alive in the telling, like Chinese whispers. We can also understand many characters by where they come from and what they believe in. In this way, mythology, or the belief in it, can be a window to the soul, as we saw with characters as diverse as Brienne, Nimble Dick Crab, and Aaron Greyjoy. So far, we really hope that we've piqued your interest on the subject of in-universe legends and how George has drawn on law from our world as inspiration, just as he does with history. We look forward to the next part of this series, where we'll sail across the narrow sea to Essos and see what myths and legends we find there. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed this installment of our extended look at the Legends of Ice and Fire. And now it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks, as always, to George R. R. Martin for his care in world building, and to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use his music in our production. We also want to take a moment to thank those of you who helped the podcast by donating via PayPal or by helping to spread the word. Your support is important to us. And now, as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Valyrian Steel and Castle Steel levels. Consider being a patron of the podcast, and you could be hearing your name here, too. Thanks to Alexis, Amber, Cinder of the Citadel, Chris K, Marja the Mage, Jessica, Joe, June, Kurt, Painkiller Jane, Rusted Revolver, John H, Lady of the Frostfangs, William James, Sir Bobby the Knight, Thrower of the Valyrian Steel Chair, Maltude, Melitza, Yorlen, Lady Steelwind, Sharon of Littlefield, J.M. Demetrios, the Mad Maester of Castle Black, Oxheart, Eliana Targaryen, Casey, Boss, Arrow Doe, Sir Kobe of House Stonesmith, Words are Wind, Deeds are Stone, Joy, Mark Joseph, a.k.a. The Snow and Winterfell, Josh, Whitney, Marcel, Matthew, Aaron, Sasha, Aileen, the Podcast Lawyer, and Lady Dyerless of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. 
And thanks as well to Sir Kyle Dane, Wielder of Sundown, Axe of the Afternoon, Matthew, Dutch, Defender of the Burn, The Red Woman, Anne, Allison, Christina, Clay, Yoan Longbeard, The Well Red, Wine Gobbler from Ultima Thule, JT was here, Monaro Geek TV, Patrick, Scott, Tammy, Goldie Juke, Tim, Clarissa, Lady Storch, Ezra, Rachel, Bright Magpie, Joseph, Kevin, Adam, Danielle, Dennis, Elizabeth, Sin Bobby Joe, The Orange Man, Emma, Jeffrey, Sarah, Judson, Roger, Jordana, Lauren, Cat of the First Men, Marjorie, Crimson Kate, Cajun Khaleesi, Emily of the Eerie, Terry, Kathleen the Ruthless, Captain of the Ironborn Ship, Night Terror, whose motto is Don't Fall Asleep, Lyanna the Little Bear, Warden of the Isles and Defender of the North, Jake, Melissa, Maria, and Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Black Rune, Sworn Alesmith to House Dark, Grandmaster of the Zithomancer's Guild, and Keeper of the Buzz. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you prefer to use, or if we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, and of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Google+, or Tumblr. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with more on The War of the Five Kings. Bye for now.